Welcome back, everybody. Next up, we have Dr. Beth. We did all that talking, and I didn't even make sure I could say <laughs> his name. So, You're good. Uh, we're, Dr. Beth LaPense? LaPense. Ah. But you know what? doesn't actually matter how you say it. This close. Stateside <laughs> says LaPense. You know, just you wing it. You go for it. <laughs> well, she is the assistant professor at of media and information at Michigan State University and a Guggenheim scholar. Guggenheim Fellow. See, I have too many screens going over here. <laughs> and we're talking about massively multi-writer games. So with that, I'm going to let you run with it. Mm. Thank you. All right. So when we get going, I'm hoping to jump into discussion with all of you because I'm certainly not the expert on this topic. I think this is something that I have some experience with and I would love to share my experience with you, but then also jump into discussion to see if we can learn from one another. All right, so context for me is that I am Anishinaabe, Métis, and Irish, and I specialize in indigenous self-determination in games. So indigenous people being at the lead of game development. In that context, then, I worked as the co-creative director for When Rivers Were Trails, which was supported by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation and the Games for Entertainment and Learning Lab at Michigan State University. And that's what I'm mostly going to be talking to you about in terms of setting an example for how you do this, because that game had around 30 writers. You know, there's an exact number there, but it gets fuzzy at some point, as anyone who has tried to manage very large writing teams will understand. I've also been a scenario writer for Dialect by Thorny Games, which I consider to be a massively multi-writer game in terms of all the scenarios that were written. I've also been a vignette writer for Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, which is from Dimble Games. And you'll see a lot of parallels between Where the Water Tastes Like Wine and When Rivers Were Trails. And I'll get into how that original game made When Rivers Were Trails possible. And then my most recent bit of experience in this has been uh, as a solar tabletop role-playing game writer in Xena language, um, the anthology component of it, which is also by Thorny Games. All right, so the plan, as I mentioned, is I'm gonna give you a rundown of the process for When Rivers Are Trails. I'm gonna talk about recommendations and then jump into Q&A or really more like a discussion because I'm sure there are insights from other people or questions that might elicit insights into how do you do this kind of work? How do you manage large writing teams and put together games that have a large amount of writers? Okay, so context for When Rivers Were Trails is that, you know what? I'm just going to show you the credits behind this game. So... Here are a number of the people who are involved. When Rivers or Trails is a 2D adventure game where you play as an Anishinaabe person who has been displaced due to the impact of allotment acts in the 1890s. And you traverse from Minnesota all the way to California, if you survive, if you make the journey. And you're making decisions all along the way which affect your well-being, your foods, and your medicines. And there are moments where you need to, you know, deplete your foods or deplete your medicines to increase and balance out your well-being. If you lose all of your well-being, you do die in the game. The game starts off effectively with a gunshot, but it's soundless. Uh, the only sounds in these games are, or in this game, is like more like the sound effects that go along with uh, subtle kinds of pieces, but not the gunshot itself. So a lot of this is writing that is then imagined and projected by the player. So you run off your land at gunpoint. This is based on a historically accurate or true story of the Northrop family. Uh, where there was a relative of theirs who had gone hunting along their trap line, had come back to their land, and their land had been given to settlers while they were away without their permission because of the government allotting land to settlers or for sale or in these sort of like checkerboarded 
portions of land back to indigenous people. But in the case of the Northrop family, the land was given to settlers and they were run off. And so all along the way during this journey, you're experiencing what need to be not entirely, you know, you can't say it's like entirely historically accurate in the sense that every single character was a real person in the 1890s. It's um, what is coming forth from a multitude of indigenous writers. These are indigenous writers who may or may not have had experience writing for games. There is actually only a handful of them who had had any genuine experience with it. So this scenario that you're seeing here is from Corey Northrup. So the Northrup you know, family being involved then at the very start of this game. And she had no experience with game writing. She does a lot of community work and workshops um, and contributes as an artist. But she has thoughts, right, about what kinds of characters there should be. All of the art was done by Washoyo Alvitre, who looked at all of the writing in the scenarios. And along with that came photos. Sometimes these photos were family photos or they were historical photos. And she worked really closely with the materials and created these sort of like vast portfolios for each of these scenarios as she was developing the art. So you'll see that as a consistent through line um, that ties together the connections between these stories. It was really important for us to have a range of two-spirit representation as well. And so in addition to having indigenous people, there was also an effort made to include uh, two-spirit indigenous people in writing different scenarios and not just having like one token two-spirit character, but rather there are threads all throughout. But ultimately what was happening throughout this whole process was that it was up to the writers what they wanted to contribute. So there was some working through of some concepts because the 1890s is an extremely traumatic time period for indigenous people and a moment of genuine genocide. And so, you know, to enlist indigenous writers and saying, hey, you all want to like make a game about that? That sounds like fun. It's terrible. And so we look towards other ways of framing it. So for example, um, Sarah Seastream is a writer who instead focused on land and on medicines. And there are characters, but the focus really is on medicinal plant teachings. We had random happenings where you go and uh, you might uh, run into wild strawberries and then you gather stories that connect to real traditional teachings about uh, strawberries as heart berries, right? And so there are all of these moments threaded through so that there's a good mix of humor, but also teachings and then the realities of what people were facing during the 1890s. The one writer who we had who does have a great deal of experience uh, is Alan Turner. Uh, he's a Black and Lakota game developer, designer, programmer. He also um, designed and then further developed uh, Edrigor, which is referred to as the indigenous Dungeons and Dragons, along with his work in the industry on games like Stubbs the Zombie. And with Alan, it was a bit of a different approach. So the strategy with other writers was for them to write about their own nations, communities, tribes, bands, however that was framed um, in terms of who they are or where they live currently and where they have ongoing community connections so that they were able to communicate with elders or other community members about what they were writing. With Alan then, he took on all of the animals throughout the entire game. And this was really important so that the key to balancing then all of this different content across all of these different writers is that while you have differences, 
there are also some through lines that are consistent enough that then you feel a sense of uh, continuity throughout. And then you're able to recognize when something is purposefully unique. So in the case of the animal scenarios, what was so important for Alan is that we often see in the context of indigenous games that animals get deeply personified, like they're humanized. Whereas um, from his way of knowing that he was working from as a writer is that animals are inherently intelligent. They don't need to be humanized to recognize their intelligence and their contribution or ways in which you can interact with them. And so that was something that was really vital throughout the game to um, give space for that type of expression. There's a story gathering component within the game. And so there are collectible stories. They are not always automatic, you know? So if you are having an interaction and maybe you're being disrespectful towards someone and you're choosing not to listen to them, then you're not going to gain that collectible story. There's nothing that really ties in directly uh, in terms of the stories themselves. Like, you know, are you, are you gaining points or losing points? It's more like, are you someone who wants to take the time to slow down in your dialogue interactions with characters in order to ensure that you are gathering all of the stories? It's actually fairly difficult to gather all of them. So it's not necessarily something that someone is going to be able to complete in its entirety, which is okay. Um, that ties into, you know, something that may be in contrast to game design, but from indigenous teachings, this idea of, you know, you don't have to have it all. The journey is really about what you were able to complete, what you were able to do not thinking about trying to get like a hundred out of a hundred, right. Of whatever, of something, right. It's not about that. It's about what was your path that you took and what were the experiences that you had along the way. Something that should be noted though, is that while it's not intrinsically linked to the stories, there is a hidden honor system in the game. And that is tied to listening to the stories, to gifting, to being respectful in your interactions. And the honor uh, ranking system is not anywhere on the UI. It's not something that's overt, it's hidden. Because the point isn't to make the player play a certain way to get a certain result. It's for them to react how they want to react and then for the system to recognize how they are behaving with the different characters, with land, uh, with animals, with the waters throughout the game. And so there are different story uh, sort of like segments, like your loading scenes that you get between each map that serves as a level effectively. And these in-between stories change depending on your level of honor. So if you're a player who has made, you know, numerous honorable choices, then you are going to get more of the resistance version of history of what was happening in the 1890s during displacement. If you're someone who has not behaved as honorably, then you're actually going to get the assimilation version of the stories. And so those are some nuances that are different in terms of the writing that you see across the game. As a note, you know, when Rivers or Trails has certainly uh, been referred to as an indigenous spin on Oregon Trail, and it is very much so that. It definitely is an indigenous response to, um, for all of those who like grow up, you know, sneaking in playing Oregon Trail during keyboarding class, if there was anyone else like that, from an indigenous perspective, it was, you know, there are terrible representations in the game. And beyond that, they're always in reference to like a settler mindset. And so the thinking was, what if we had a game in schools? And what if there was another generation that was raised with a video game in their classrooms, but it was actually from an indigenous perspective, right? About westward expansion and like tackling what that was but still having a journey and so 
because of that, we have um, a hunting mini game, a fishing mini game, and canoeing, which is an homage to, you know, poor wagons drowning in the, in the waters there in the rivers. And so throughout the game, while it is very writing heavy, there are these moments where through your dialogue interactions, you can access these mini games or there are predetermined nodes on the map, which um, automatically prompt you to these mini games. And so there's a break in the type of gameplay throughout. Okay, so the last form of content in When Rivers Were Trails that I'll talk about are random happenings. And random happenings look just like this. They're a different kind of template. And so these did not have art except for in the instances where you saw earlier the strawberries. So in some instances, if you end up gathering uh, foods or, or plants, plant medicines, then you'll actually get to see art that relates to that. So the random happenings are genuinely randomized. So you hit a node that says, you know, pull from this pool of random happenings and something will pop up. Sometimes they are relative to the location that you're in. So some of them do have parameters about which map they can be activated on. But all sorts of things can happen in random happenings. You could, you know, encounter an animal or you might find uh, plants that are growing that need to be tended or uh, you might see uh, constellations in the sky. It might be night and you're seeing um, constellations and you're gaining an understanding of uh, constellations from an Anishinaabe perspective. Or uh, you might encounter an Indian agent and you might have to make the decision about if you're going to have a try to negotiate or are you going to fight? Or are you going to run? And the success of your response is contingent on the clan that you selected for yourself at the beginning of the game. And so there are different clans, for example, um, Name uh, means sturgeon in my language. And then there's also, uh, there's a uh, Makwa bear uh, as a clan. Uh, and so those decisions that you've made in the very start of the game will influence the outcomes during these random happenings. So that sort of like gives you a sense of the content. Um, I wrote the random happenings. So that was me. So if you run into a moment where, you know, a settler asks you to eat with them and you do and you end up getting dysentery from it. That's, that's on me. That's my sense of humor coming out. Cause like who didn't love at least like, you know, saying you, you died of dysentery, you know, in your gravestones. So that kind of covers the scope of when rivers or trails. And then I want to talk about recommendations based on what happened during when rivers or trails but also my experiences and um, recommendations from other developers who were very uh, kind and gracious to share their insights with me. Okay, so at the outset, when you're managing a team of that scale, the really imp important like first choice is to choose a path. Do you already have mechanics that are set in stone? Or do you have generative mechanics, which are based on the content that you receive from writers? Or do you have a mix of both? For When Rivers Were Trails, I provided templates for each of the, the contributors. That's not to say they necessarily follow the template <laughs> in all cases. And they understood that there were um, like certain prescribed mechanics that were a through line throughout the game. So the ability to resist, um, the ability to trade, gift, listen, those um, types of mechanics were all options that they had to choose from. So they could write towards those mechanics or, and this is where if you're managing a team of this scale, obviously the you know, more supportive game design choice is that you're working with a game that predominantly uses text, then they can potentially generate mechanics themselves. And so that's something that's, you know, a really important way to 
give writers the sense that you're not just coming to them and saying, Hey, I need this content. You just, you just fill this in. Right. So for me, what is most important is a sense of self-determination and uh, giving writers the space to have an influence over the gameplay itself which ties into this idea of sovereignty. So in an indigenous context, um, I look to uh, Batchewana elder Carol Najwan in terms of her definition of sovereignty, which is the ability for indigenous people to have self-governance and self-expression on their own terms. So, you know, one way that she talks about it is having control. So, you know, that's an important term, right, within the context of working with Indigenous writers in this context is that there is a, a sense of them having control or say, and final say, in what their written content looks like. There were parameters put on when rivers or trails. So for example, um, Sarah Seastream, you know, uh, originally had pitched that uh, the dog who attends um, by the side of a woman who knows plant teachings might like, you know, tear you apart if you behave poorly towards her. And because this was a game that was going to be, we knew was going to be in middle schools, there was a certain level of like limitation that had to be put on the first round of content pitches. But the important thing was to not waste writer's time by saying, just do everything right, but to have a conversation about where they were going with the content so that it could be adjusted in a way that would fit the, the not being prevented, you, you know, from, or not being prevented from being in classrooms, right? That was an important piece for this game and is not necessarily always the case for all games. We certainly joke around about how it would be great to have an uncensored version of When Rivers Are Trails, which is something that definitely is a consideration because there was a lot of uh, really intense happenings during the 1890s and only some of them are able to be shown through text in this game. But the important thing was that you know, they were identifying the characters that they wanted to write. What were they inspired by? Are they inspired by the land and the, the placement of where their stories are going to happen? That means that along the way, you're going to really need to, as Catherine Heim suggests from Thorny Games, embrace simplicity. This is one that's really interesting to me because um, within When Rivers or Trails, the writing styles were vastly different. You had um, Trevino Brings Plenty writing a form of poetry for his scenarios. You then had um, Sterling Holy White Mountain, who is Blackfeet, whose scenarios were, I believe, the longest in the game and several paragraphs long. And when the question came up of, you know, do we make edits to this? It's like, you know what? It's very Blackfeet that he did it this way. So we're just going to leave it the way it is. And people have to accept as they're playing this difference in the writing style. So there are spaces allowed for complexities, but then the idea is also to embrace simplicity. So for Catherine Hines and the work that she does on uh, dialect and then on other games, she really recommends welcoming content from writers being just like, obvious sometimes that it doesn't have to always be really complex that you can have content that's to the point in order to have stability throughout the work and that's something that i think that as a writer i appreciate and then also struggle with because there is sometimes a sense of oh i've got to you know put all these characters together in this very complex way so it seems like it has depth but in fact um there is space for that and there should also be space for then having a clear sort of framework that and through line throughout your work. And sometimes that means, as she says, I didn't want to write it down, but she's like, sometimes some parts of it are going to be boring and that's okay. And I think it's hard for me. I struggle a bit from a writer, not from a, the creative director end, from the creative director. And I'm like, 
yeah, you know, like the writer needs to do what they need to do. Um, and then, but as a writer, I'm like, I don't want to be perceived as boring. That sounds terrible. Right. So there's that tension there um, that you would have to sort through on the work that you're doing. Okay. So the last bit of recommendations here are like the logistics. So you know, there's like content and creativity and, you know, the design choices you're making. And then there's like just the practicality of like, you have like around and see, this is the thing is like, I'm pretty sure it's like, sometimes I count it. And I'm like, yes, it was 30 writers. Yes, that's the number. And then other times I'm like, I don't, it's all a blur. I'm not actually sure what happened. I know the game is finished and, you know, we won an award at Indicate. So I think we did well. I think, I think, I think it all worked out in the end, you know? But the logistics then um, get more particular. Like, how does it actually work? Like, how do you actually do that? So I mentioned this earlier where you provide clear templates. So I think what's important in the context of if, you're, if part of your work is increasing uh, diverse voices within games, to understand that it's really important to actually go to other areas of work to invite people in, or if someone approaches you to be open-minded about where they're coming from. So in When Rivers or Trails, um, for example, Sarah Seastream is a very uh, well-known and very successful artist in terms of gallery art. I mean, she's, she's like an artiste with a capital A, right? And then you have, um, other writers who are poets or they're writing fiction or they're writing nonfiction um, or they've worked on film and, you know, potentially maybe have played games, maybe they're gamers, maybe they're not. There's a whole wide range of experiences. And so through that, just providing really clear templates with examples. So you should note with examples is really helpful. And then um, trying to keep the notes on that as simple as possible. Catherine Himes recommends play testing your own guidelines. So don't just think, hey, I've written a template. It's all good. I'm going to, I'm just going to release it to all the writers and watch chaos unfold. No, instead do start with doing a run through yourself to work out, um, does this really make sense? And then having someone else uh, on your team, even if they're not a writer, try to go through the process with you or on their own actually so that they can come back to you with comments about what might help in terms of clarity, right? Because you're effectively going to be training people through this process. And that's something that's really important is if you have the capacity to bring in a lot of writers from a lot of different areas and understand that a part of the time that you need to build in then is, uh, is about the, the training and the iteration. Uh, Johanna Min, who um, worked on Where the Water Tastes Like Wine and really is a huge proponent of, uh, of When Rivers Were Trails, this game would not have been possible if he had not shared code with us that helped us link Unity with Ink. And so when Rivers or Trails uses ink all throughout, it was an extremely helpful structure for us because it was really fluid in terms of the ability to edit it later on when we had any kind of revisions or to implement additional random happenings to balance and create, you know, generate like more content to make sure that there was enough of, um, you know, that interesting kind of change that happens plus the the linearness of the character scenarios. You want something that feels robust. And so it's really because of Johanneman that our game was possible because he's always been very gracious about sharing his process and then content um, with us and then also the technical side as well. And so something that he learned from his work was to have an editor and a writer manager early on. He did not have that, and there are differences in how the um, story content rolls out because of that. You know, he brought in um, a really great editor later on and somebody to, you know, manage the writing team. In my case with Wood Rivers or Trails, I did all of that, 
And then I was working with a student team. And so there became a tension with the student team thinking that they had say in editing the content for the writers, which uh, then, you know, was a point of discussion. And we had to really work through it. And we had to like go back and make sure that um, all of the edits that had to happen for like technical reasons um, in terms of like, you know, are the are the mechanics working like, you know, when they uh, select the option of gifting something, is that actually what's happening in the scenario? Those kinds of aspects of the writing were all revisited and refined um, with me overseeing all the content. So you do want one person. It shouldn't, like the ideal is not for you to have to do all of that. Um, I did that's probably not how it should go. So I'm not really making, I'm more like saying, this is a recommendation of like how you probably should do things. It's not necessarily a reflection of how I do things because um, with the work that I do, I tend to look very closely at everything. And so um, I was hugely a part of, of all of that work that happened with the writing. All right. so. Basics, like I'm sure everybody knows this, or this, this should really be a given when you're working with writing teams of this size, is to offer timeline flexibility. Whatever you think the deadline should be, and whatever you say the deadline should be, make sure that the writers think that there's a certain, this is terrible. And don't do this to me as a writer, but you know, like as a creative director, I'm saying, you tell your writers there's a certain deadline, but you actually have several more weeks than that than, than they know. <laughs> because it's there, stuff is going to happen with that many people. Uh, the turnaround you're going to need to create buffers for yourself. And Catherine recommends having an internal tracking system. So, you know, something you can do is have like a Google sheet or Excel sheet. And, you know, you have all of your writers listed, you have all the content deliverables, and then you're able to um, keep track of, who has turned in what, what stage is it at, has it been revised, what are the links to all of the files so you can keep track of that. And there was some of that on When Rivers Are Trails, but I would prefer to, to streamline that more because I do think that that's very helpful. I've taken these lessons from games and I'm actually applying them to um, a werewolf comic anthology that I'm editing right now. And so the vastness of and the complexity of working on a game has made it a lot clearer for me about how to put together um, a comic anthology. So these skills are applicable across the different types of medium. All right, so um, the last thing here, the last tip I received um, was largely from Johanneman because, and I didn't experience this working on where the water tastes like wine because I had been included earlier on and sort of as an outlier where there are a couple scenarios I have in there. Um, but the rest of the team was actually working together in Slack. So this idea of facilitating communication across all writers to help with continuity, I really value. We did not do that on When Rivers or Trails. People really were working um, individually and then some people who were checking out the game were able to see, you know, what the threads and what was happening, but uh, largely people were working independently. For me, sometimes that can be really interesting because instead of having this focus of trying to make all the content especially unique, for me, at least in the context of working with Indigenous creatives, it's actually interesting to see themes. So if something continues to pop up, well, then that's a theme that's being evoked. In the case of where the water tastes like wine, they did want to have better communication because they didn't want everything to be about just like death. Like every scenario is about dying. That's what it's about, right? You know, they didn't want to have those patterns uh, dominate. They needed to make sure that there was variety in terms of the outcomes. So um, with When Rivers or Trails, we didn't run into that, there was naturally enough variety. But I think if there had not been, then uh, communication across all the writers to make sure that they know uh, who is writing what uh, would have been very helpful and very important. Uh, for me, 
If I were to do this personally, I would choose discord uh, because I feel like then there's a more casual kind of environment and, you know, there's an opportunity for brainstorming and discussion. Um, I believe that for where the water tastes like wine, they did use Slack. And so uh, for me, Slack has that more sort of like, okay, I'm logging into Slack and I'm doing work now kind of feeling. And uh, for me personally, using Discord would be the direction I would go. Um, but actually that probably depends on each game. So what kind of feel are you going for with the game? Do you want something that feels like, you know, everyone has ex access to everyone else? Are the um, writers actually making clusters? So they're writing towards the levels that they're working on. All of those different variants are possible. Okay. So with those notes in mind, I wanna open it up to discussions as well as questions. I also um, really advise checking out uh, the talk, Just Enough Cooks in the Kitchen, Managing an Anthology Game with 25 Writers, which is about where the water tastes like wine if you're interested in seeing another full-scale approach to massively multi-writer games. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, I did, I purposely did not go presentation mode on the slides so that I was able to know where I was going. That's, I needed to know. <laughs> well, don't worry. I was just sitting here and talking with mute on. So it's all, it's all good. We're winning it. Exactly. Winning, yeah. winning at life. Totally caught up on sleep. Anyway, so, um, so what have the, been the big differences that you've seen between working with who will, I'll go with professional teams versus, you know, the academics and the volunteers and the organizations and things like that and the way that they handle project management and, and writer management in general. Yeah, there's a lot more experience naturally on the end of, you know, teams who have had that kind of experience primarily. However, then um, I do feel like there are certain patterns that get fixed in place, right? So, when you have this openness, then there is this possibility of like, yeah, why not have a scenario that is a certain form of poetry? Sure, like let's go ahead and do that and experiment and have that openness. So that's the primary difference I've seen is that there are, um, you know, draws and then also limitations to either direction you go in. All right. If y'all got questions, here's your chance to ask. Pop them in chat. Or comments. This is the perfect talk for like, I have a comment, not a question, you know? <laughs> that works as well. The, um, and I had another one. Oh, so one, when you're dealing with your writers and you give them fake deadlines, uh, coming, <gasps> coming from someone who has been both a producer and an executive producer of games over the years, I did that all the time. That's just, yeah. I feel dishonest. I am chronically honest. And so it is a struggle for me to do that. And, you know, I'm always like, okay, but they know there's more time, right? You know, and, but I've learned from experience. Like earlier on in my career, I, I did make the mistake of going like, it's all good. It'll, it'll be great. You know, it'll be fine. They'll all hit their deadlines and then, it, it doesn't go that way. <laughs> it never goes that way. Especially when you just have so many people, like there's always going to be something. So you, you know, I, I learned the hard way to build it in. Like I used to have a, a mandatory two week cushion in between when things were actually due and when the teams or the other people involved in the project thought they were due. Um, yeah. And <laughs> That that comes from a combination of, you know, managing external development, doing business development and knowing you're bound by a contract somewhere and yeah. then just knowing how people are and how game development goes. So, uh, yeah, oh. that's nice. Like there's a comment there that someone would refer to them as real deadlines and then having forgiveness. And I appreciate that, you know, that there's that makes me feel like I'm being honest, right? Like that there is a genuine deadline and but you're just being you're, you're being forgiving about it and you're building that time in. So I think that's actually a much nicer way to frame it and probably better for everyone in terms of how the team feels about the work that they're doing. 
I don't think anyone who's ever worked with me would believe me if I told them that though. It's like, <laughs> you're not the, yeah, no, that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. Um, <laughs> Michelle asked, do you find that the massive multi-writer approach works best in the context of more vignette anthology work as opposed to a game with more a contained or linear story? That's an incredible question because, um, you know, uh, where the water tastes like wine is contextualized as an anthology and vignette style. Also, um, dialect is in terms of writing individual scenarios. And then certainly the uh, Xeno language anthology of um, independent uh, tabletop role playing games. I worked on a solo journaling game for that one. So that it feels like that's the case. Now, when Rivers Retrails, although originally I did set out to have it be nonlinear because it was going to be in classrooms, the question came up, well, you know, what if people are missing content? You can't actually just have them miss complete communities, right? And so the game after the fact, after all the um, scenarios came in, uh, was linearized. And so I think it is actually possible to do that linearization. But uh, in the case of When Rivers or Trails, it became, um, that's what the random happenings helped with, was sort of like buffering in between and creating these moments of transitions or even like peaks of activity as you went through. So I think it's possible, but I have never set out to do that, right? It was something that had to happen as the game was being iterated. Uh, and I would be interested in seeing what it's like to have a more contained or linear story in the context of working with, um, you know, sovereignty and wanting sovereignty, then I'm always of the mindset of saying, hey, like, let it form into whatever it's going to form into. And so maybe that will be something that's li linear and maybe it'll be something that's nonlinear. So Richard says, how do you maintain con continuity of vision across the widely geographically scattered team? Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And there's a balance in that. I think for when rivers or trails, that was fairly simple in the sense that when you evoke the 1890s, Many, um, I think all of the writers were able to go, yeah, I, I know about that. I've heard about that. I know how rough that was, right? You know, because it's, it's a cataclysmic moment uh, for indigenous nations. And so in the United States specifically, because of what the Allotment um, Act was doing or in the various forms of Allotment Acts. And so there was that shared vision from the outset, which is just inherent to um, that process. Now, having said that, uh, there was also, we also brought in uh, Toya Finley as well as Kat Wendit. And so there were black and Chinese representations of characters um, sort of like, you know, sort of pinpointed at really important geographically relevant moments. Like it was all in relation to the land and uh, they have different, perspectives, right? And I still understand that time period in that way. But those were the moments where you can see, oh, this is actually important to bring in more perspectives, right? And so if the vision is strong enough through a core of the writers, then you can play with having um, outliers or different perspectives that can help then uh, really recognize that it's important to have those um, different views represented in especially this type of work. So for me, you know, what the shared vision, uh, I think for when rivers or trails was let's take, let's take over Oregon trail. <laughs> that was the, that was the joke. That was like the humorous spin that kept people going uh, throughout content development. So here's a pro tip for all of you students out there and folks who are new to the industry. If you have not gathered from this conference already, all the narrative folks and the writers know each other. And if you do one dirty, you are screwed. Oh, for real. For industry. real. For real. 
that's legit right there. <laughs> we, we always joke that this is a very big, but a very small industry because we all know one, one another. Yeah. But, you know, over the course of the last couple of years, when I've worked with more of the, the writers in the industry and the, and the narrative designers, it's like, oh my God, y'all really do know all of you and and you travel in a pack wherever yeah. you go so yeah don't and don't there's do your... comfort with that because like i remember very like clearly thinking okay i'm bringing in toya and cat on this and i know they'll look at the template and they'll get it like they're good so then i knew that i could focus on uh working more closely with uh people who did not previously have game writing experience so there's a real benefit certainly to having the, that network and those connections and, you know, going to people who, you know, uh, I think, I think that's how the industry works. And, you know, I'm certainly one, I, I do a bit of both, right. It's like working with the people who, you know, and love and, you know, who you understand will be reliable. I think reliability is really a key there, but then also um, a huge part of my work is in building that capacity where there'll be new people who um, maybe, maybe, will go on to continue working in games and maybe won't some have and some some are continuing to do um their previous work as they were uh, david's got a question that and i had a similar question can you talk a little about the research process when it comes to writing game narrative based on real cultures and people is it up to each individual writer to cross-reference it or is it a team effort mine was similar it's like how much re-education did you have to do you know because our generation coming up through school, it was like, well, the, the Native Americans and the pilgrims met at Thanksgiving and they were yeah. all happy, happy, lovey, lovey. And how much research and, and re-education is, is required in a lot of this? This is where there is such a benefit to actually directly involving the people of, you know, the representation that is happening in the game in the development process itself. Because while there is you know, you can still cross-reference, cross then you're looking to them to have those understandings. Not only that, but, you know, these are people who are connected to their communities today. So there are, you know, elders who are around, like we're all still alive and still doing work. And so, you know, there's a presence that happens there. And so it's really important then that, um, in fact, I actually, those who named um, the elders or fluent language speakers who were involved in uh, translations for them, language translations, they were included as writers and given a writer credit. And I think that that's something that doesn't happen often enough. I think um, translators, as they are often framed, and uh, cultural uh, knowledge carriers then, you know, get sort of credited as consultants, right? When in fact, um, maybe the work that they're contributing influences the design. And so uh, crediting people with titles for the work that they're actually doing is really vital because then that means that uh, they're being approached f possibly for those types of roles in the future without being like siloed into, oh, you're just a cultural consultant or um, I think something that's really popular is this idea of like sensitivity readers uh, where you've already developed the content, now we're just going to bring in someone to give it the stamp of approval or not, and but you're still not working really closely with um, communities in order to make those decisions. It's just sort of like, a, you know, you're running it by someone. And that's not in-depth enough, I think, you know, especially for a game like When Rivers Were Trails. And so effectively, the responsibility was on individual writers, and then much like how writers and game industry are connected, uh, you know, people who are indigenous are very well connected. And so it's sort of similar thing, <laughs> you know, you're all a lot of connection and communication that happens um, across communities there, but that's speaking specifically to indigenous communities. And I think it's really important that um, with, you know, whatever representation that you're going for, that uh, you're making sure to in involve people. So what was, what I won't say was, is the biggest barrier to releasing, like you said, the more raw version of the game? Is that a consumer side thing or was that a, what was the? It was the funding side. So this was funded by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. It was actually, the money was actually given by the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. And it is, it's really incredible. It's actually you know, quite unprecedented um, that this was indigenous 
funding, right? And so because of that, it had um, the space to be very self-determined, very sovereign. Um, the game was uh, reviewed by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation board along the way. So they have like an advisor. And so there were all of these systems of vetting it all the way through, but because um, the funding was in order to get the game within schools, which we didn't even know would be possible. Like that was the dream, that was a hope, and it has. I mean, it's it's definitely being circulated in public schools, tribal schools, and then also in um, tribal colleges, tribal institutions, and then universities um, with uh, students who are not indigenous uh, have been uh, playing the game as well. And so, you know, I think that the goals that you have then at the outset, they are, uh, there's to some extent that they can become malleable. So I don't know, like, I think if we did do the uncensored version, some of it would be really great. And then some of it would be horrifically dark. And so, you know, I think that's the question we come up against is like, how far would we want to go? <laughs> you know, and we're, the game is already banned in um, certain countries, even because there's a reference to alcohol in the game. So there's, um, an instance with an Indian agent where you as the player are accused of uh, carrying alcohol on you. And so they're using that as a justification to arrest you, but you do not have alcohol on you. It's just an accusation. And just the very mention of the term alcohol gets it banned in certain places. It also is already banned in certain places just because of the mention of tobacco. You'll see on this um, slide I still up, have up here, this is um, a tobacco tie, a sama, sama tie. And the way that this is um, used is as an offering. And so just the very mention of tobacco, it's never being smoked in the game. There's you know, no activity of there. Um, you offer it during the hunting mini game. And it's a bit comical because um, if you offer a Sama tobacco and you shoot a squirrel, you're gonna get more meat than if you had shot a deer without offering a Sama. So, you know, there's humor built in, but just the very mention and presence of tobacco, um, you know, there are forms of censorship in certain places that get it shut down and it's not, um, it's not able to make it to app stores in certain places. So, you know, those are the kinds of considerations that we were like, no, that's a hard line for us. Like there are, uh, certain points where we'll look at the content and and bring it back but in terms of you know offering a sama then no we're going to move forward with that despite where it might get us blocked all right we got two more questions and we're going right. to try to get them in here really okay. super quick so quick. what would you say to someone who's trying to take real life cultures and mix them up in an alternate world that is similar yet different how would one avoid offending the cultures involved and then the next one actually bleeds into it, you know, when you're making these types of games, where are the good places and references to begin saying, hey, we need to consult some indigenous indigenous peoples with us? Early on, and I mean, that's with any form of representation. So if you have queer characters um, is something that comes to mind for me as a, as a frequent point, you know, like right from the beginning, like before you're making all the designs decisions, you know, um, hopefully uh, there are people who are being involved at the outset. That's what's really, uh, you know, essential for that. But um, in terms of offending, I think someone is always going to be offended and it's important to do the best that you can understanding that context is so very important uh, I've been working on the game uh, Weird West as one of the writers, and I've done what I can uh, in, in good conscience with the game, but it is a video game that has certain kind of parameters around the design. For example, it's procedurally generated. Um, you know, the, the dialogue pulls out of pools. Um, and so, you know, I've done as much as I can, but it takes place in an alternate history uh, where, or an alternate reality where um, Anishinaabe who were pushed west, which really did happen historically, there was displacement where Anishinaabe were pushed west, they're the focus. And so, you know, it's weird west, it's supposed to be weird, but I do feel that, and I do recognize that that will be offensive to some people and um, and that's gonna be hard. I think that's gonna be hard to take. Um, it's gonna hurt, and it, but it's gonna happen. And so, you know, you do your best, I think, within the context of a game and you work with people. I think that 
you know, as long as you're doing your due diligence to, you know, reach out to elders and storytellers. And I really think of, um, for weird West, uh, you know, having conversations with people who, uh, you know, talk about the kinds of issues that are evoked in the game, like Winona Leduc um, and other Anishinaabe people, you look to people and have conversations, not just like looking them up on the internet and doing some research, but actually engaging in conversation. That's really vital. Awesome. Thank you, Beth. And Beth is going to be around on the Discord for a little bit. If anyone has extra questions, we will be in the post-show uh, comments section. Next up, we're going to kick it over to Dan. And what do we got next? How to make real-time music-driven games with David Klinger. So, all right, we'll see you all in just a minute. Thanks, everybody. Bye, my Pete. Bye.